In the winter of 1923, Adolf Hitler is at an all-time low. His audacious attempt to seize power in a coup has been an embarrassing failure, and he's going to jail. His Nazi party, seen only as a band of fringe revolutionaries, is on the verge of being shut down. But Hitler has a plan. He's going to take the Nazis into the mainstream of politics. He wanted to become a respectable parliamentarian without being any of those things. Purpose, love of the nation, nationalism, that'll take us through, that will carry the day. And it does. This is the story of how Hitler's reinvention of the Nazi party and a financial catastrophe opened the door for him to win the hearts and minds of the German nation. Adolf Hitler is led into court to stand trial for high treason. Four months before, Hitler and his National Socialist Party had attempted to overthrow the German Weimar government in Munich. But they had failed. The Beer Hall Putsch is a humiliating setback for the Nazis and a personal blow for Hitler. Remarkably, just before the trial began, he was visited by some colleagues and they found him so depressed he was actually contemplating suicide. Whether that was a bluff, we're not sure, but he told them he felt so low. Hitler is absolutely despondent. It basically has been a disaster and he knows it and he thinks that this is the end of his career. And then something very strange happens. Incredibly, even in the moment of total catastrophe, Hitler is already plotting a comeback. In court, he realizes this is an opportunity. This isn't going to be the kind of end of Hitler. This is gonna be the making of a new Hitler. You can't imagine, actually, a better theatre for Hitler outside a beer hall. Hitler had been expected to deny his part in the plot. But instead, he openly admits his guilt. I alone bear the responsibility. But I'm not a criminal because of that. If today I stand here as a revolutionary, it is as a revolutionary against the revolution. There is no such thing as high treason against the traitors of 1918. In a series of speeches, he lays out his case. First, he targets the Treaty of Versailles signed at the end of the First World War, which has left Germany financially crippled. He's outraged that Germany has been forced to pay huge sums to the Allies for starting the war, leaving its people starving and impoverished. For us, it was a filthy crime against the German people, a step in the back for the German nation. Hitler personified a widespread belief Hitler was tapping into a very, very strong German national trope. They felt that Germany had got a bum deal at Versailles. He's disgusted by the seizure of Germany's richest industrial territory, the Ruhr, by the Allies. And he blames the left-wing German politicians who, he says, surrendered pathetically in 1918. 
his impassioned speeches strike a chord. Instead of being a traitor, he portrays himself as a patriot trying to restore the nation's honor. The idea of the victim status of Germany, the idea the Allies are at fault in imposing Versailles upon them, and the fact that Weimar itself, the government, is at fault in giving in to so many demands from outside and not having the capacity to lead Germany correctly. He's got quite a degree of sympathy going for him. But Hitler also states something else. The leadership of Germany, he proclaims, is his destiny. The man who feels called upon to govern a people has no right to say, if you want me or summon me, I will cooperate. No, it is his duty to step forward. The man who is born to be a dictator is not compelled. He wills it. Hitler's performances are so mesmeric, they make news not only across Germany, but around the globe. In Britain, the Daily Express names Hitler Bavaria's uncrowned king and a tub-thumping patriot who, it suggests, may be heard from again someday. But Hitler still has to convince one person at his trial, the judge. After four weeks in court, he reaches his verdict. for leading an attempted coup against the state, Hitler gets the grand total of a five-year sentence, which is incredibly short. He's lucky, actually, to not get a death sentence. Hitler's interned 40 miles west of Munich in the picturesque town of Landsberg and he's treated like royalty in exile. With his newfound celebrity status, Hitler uses his prison stay as a PR opportunity, inviting his own photographer to record his incarceration. It's just one of a number of privileges he's given behind bars. Hitler would later make out that his time in Landsberg prison was pretty hellish, but in fact, the truth was quite the opposite. He can walk around the gardens as and when he likes. Some of his cronies are allowed to come in and out and visit him. This isn't a prison. This is a kind of nationalist holiday camp. It was very comfortable. He had his own favorite wicker chair. He had windows to look out of, and he actually grew quite porky. He ate quite a lot of meat. He drank quite a lot of alcohol. He has three-course meals that are brought in. Parties even go on inside his quarters. He was able to fraternize with friends, and he was able to listen to music. Hitler's music of choice is Wagner. He had access to a wind-up gramophone. The old large 78s would be at his disposal. He adored Wagner, and even as a teenager, he would spend his last grossions, his last shillings, on going to the opera in Vienna and listening to Wagner operas. For the Austrian-born Hitler, Wagner embodies everything he loves about his adopted country, Germany. It's the nature of the music that took Hitler. The grandness of the music, the sheer expansion of it, the, the, the themes themselves, taking on the gods of the great traditions of German culture. It's grand, it's ambitious, it's hugely confident. 
he saw in Wagner inspirational content. Stirred by this sense of nationalism and by the works of an array of philosophers he spends hours absorbing, Hitler decides to set down on paper his own beliefs. If you're going to be a national socialist party, you're competing with the Communist Party, and they have a book on which they base their ideas, which is Das Kapital by Karl Marx. So he decides that the Nazi party needs a philosophical tract where he can outline the ideology of the party. Imprisoned with him at Landsberg is one of Hitler's co-conspirators from the Beer Hall Putsch, Rudolf Hess. Now acting as his private secretary, Hess takes dictation from Hitler day after day as he embarks on the book which will define Nazism. My struggle, or Mein Kampf, is supposed to be a deep personal statement from Hitler. It's the man talking about himself and his ideas for the first time in a systematic way, and that's why it's so significant. Distorted tales about Hitler's childhood, his early youth in Vienna, and his war experiences are mixed together with political and racial theorizing. But the concepts within it aren't his own. Mein Kampf really is based on a number of ideas that he's heard. It's kind of a melting pot of ideas robbed from philosophy, taken from, you know, the back of a, of a, of a beer mat. Really, it's a kind of mishmash. At its heart is Hitler's belief that the Aryan German people are the natural master race. And that Germany's biggest enemy are the Jews. The personification of the devil as the symbol of all evil assumes the living shape of the Jew. Hitler believes that the Jews are a genetically inferior race and that they're to blame for everything that's wrong with Germany, including the country's capitulation in the First World War and its economic plight. He is and remains a typical parasite, a sponger who, like a noxious bacillus, keeps spreading as soon as a favorable medium invites him. On top of this, he blames them for communism. In Bolshevism, we must see the attempt undertaken by the Jews in the 20th century to achieve world domination. He goes his way the way of sneaking in among the nations and boring from within with lies and slander, poison and corruption. Mein Kampf even contains a frightening warning about Hitler's intentions. The whole text is shot through with incredibly violent language. Page after page, we get the language of eradication, annihilation, destruction, extermination. Hitler believes the only way to solve the Jewish problem is to destroy the Jewish parasite. There can be no doubt that if Hitler comes to power, there is going to be some kind of a reckoning with the Jews. Hitler's next key policy is inspired by a Munich University lecturer in political geography and a former tutor to Rudolf Hess, Dr. Karl Haushofer. During a visit to Landsberg prison, Haushofer introduces Hitler to the concept of Lebensraum, literally, living room. Implicit within Lebensraum is this idea of territorial acquisition. Karl Haushofer believes that Germany is 
overpopulated. And he says that the only way for Germany to break out from its density of population is to get living space, Lebensraum. Lebensraum gives Hitler the idea that in order for the nation to become a great power, Germany must invade other countries, particularly those populated with the races he deems inferior. That would imply, wouldn't it, that Germany needed to gain territory from other countries and, of course, take over Poland and the Soviet Union. Now, Hitler's thoughts on the Treaty of Versailles, the destruction of the Jews, communism, German supremacy and headlong expansion have been crystallized for public consumption. Mein Kampf will serve as the blueprint of the Third Reich and Hitler's dream of a new order. All he has to do is take it to the German people. After serving just nine months of a five-year sentence, the 35-year-old Hitler prepares himself for his release. Despite being sent to jail for trying to overthrow the German Weimar government, in the year since his failed coup in Munich, he's transformed himself from violent revolutionary to national hero. But the wave of popularity doesn't last. While in private, Hitler had been preparing his Bible for Nazism, outside prison, he's been practically forgotten. And if he expected a horde of well-wishers at the gates, he doesn't get them. Instead, there's only a car to meet him. The reason? Germany is booming. The democratic government has borrowed billions from overseas to pay its war debts. Now the country's growing fat on foreign money, particularly from the United States. The mid-1920s are very much the golden years of the Weimar Republic. The Americans give them a vast range of loans, and because of this, Germany revives. The German economy improves dramatically enough for the Weimar democratic government to look like it's starting to work. At last, it seems like the days of suffering are over. It's very much seen as a period of new beginning. After the turbulence of the hyperinflation, things are looking up. People are broadly happy with the political system as long as it delivers the goods, as long as it delivers growth and stability. But for Hitler, all this prosperity is disastrous. No one wants to hear from a radical revolutionary party particularly one that wants to seize power by force. Worse still, as punishment for the Beer Hall Putsch, Hitler's been banned from public speaking. There's even talk of deporting him back to his native Austria. And that isn't the end of the bad news. The Nazi party's in a state of collapse. Hitler's trusted friend and right-hand man, the war hero, Hermann Goering, who had stood by his side during the Beer Hall Putsch, has become hooked on drugs. Shot and wounded in the leg during the Putsch, he'd escaped capture, but hospitalized in Austria, he's become reliant on morphine. It left him with recurrent pain when he had a couple of operations. 
During one of the operations, he was given morphine for the pain. He becomes addicted. He was getting supplies of it from his doctor surreptitiously, and he was injecting morphine and becoming more and more addicted to it. Things are so bad that in the coming months, Goering will be committed to a mental asylum. It became so twitchy and, and, and violent. They had to restrain him, and he was put in a straitjacket for some weeks because he was in such a state. He got over it, but his morphine addiction remains. Meanwhile, the party newspaper is closed down by order of the state. Nazi party membership that had reached 55,000 in 1923 now collapses by more than half. And in the elections of December 1924, the Nazis are routed taking just 3% of the vote. The party's been hit hard by Hitler's absence and by a sea change in public opinion. It was a natural decline, really. If the man who made the party what it was, if he's not there, it's bound to go to some decline. Then if we had to that, the economic recovery, then Nazism didn't have that strong appeal that it had prior to the putsch. Even more humiliating, when Mein Kampf Hitler's autobiographical manifesto is published, it's a commercial flop. It sells only 10,000 copies. Not even every Nazi buys one. For Hitler, this is a crisis moment. His party's on the verge of extinction. If he's to turn things around, something's going to have to change. Hitler made the decision that from here on, the Nazis must no longer be a revolutionary, violent party. They must adopt the forms of legalism. They must stand in elections. They must go through the motions of being a democratic parliamentary party. Hitler decrees that the Nazi party will be relaunched. It will be reputable and democratic seeking power not through violence, but by winning seats in the German parliament, the Reichstag. He didn't resile at all his view that parliament was a nest of fools and traitors, that democracy was a ridiculous facade manipulated by the Jews and the communists, but he would go through the motions because he saw the putsch and violence had been an abject failure. He wanted to put on the garb, the mantle, the coat of respectability and become, at least on the surface, a respectable parliamentarian without being any of those things. Behind closed doors, Hitler tells his inner circle. We shall have to hold our noses and enter the Reichstag. If outvoting them takes longer than outshooting them, at least the results will be guaranteed by their own constitution. Sooner or later, we shall have majority. And after that, we shall have Germany. Now Hitler starts to develop the tactics that will ultimately propel his party to power. Outwardly, he and the Nazis will present a veneer of respectability while inwardly sticking to their violent and extremist plans. They've got to look like they are working within the political system and that they are a real and credible political party and not just a bunch of lunatics who try to seize beer halls in Munich. With Germany now seemingly prosperous under a democratic government, Hitler realizes that the only way he can take power is to win the hearts and minds of the German people in an election. To kick off their charm offensive, the Nazi party needs an image overhaul. And it begins with Hitler himself. For help, he turns to his Lebensraum guru, Dr. Karl Haushofer. 
He was a major influence, not simply in ideas, but in technique of presentation. This notion that presentation is everything in politics. Haushofer helps to construct a series of new looks for Hitler to make him appeal to as many people across Germany as possible. He can either present the kind of traditional German folkish figure in lederhosen and the long socks and the walking shoes, and that appeals to a certain element of the community. He can also look much more technocratic, and he can wear a very smart lounge suit. And if he's at a great Nazi rally, he's in his uniform. But it's not only his appearance that Hitler wants to improve. To keep his head clear and his voice protected after long speeches, Haushofer replaces Hitler's steins of strong Bavarian beer with cups of herbal tea. But most importantly, he trains Hitler in the art of public speaking, teaching him ways to gesticulate, to emphasize his arguments, and increase his self-confidence. The idea of, of how to deliver a speech, to whom are you speaking? Adjust your tone, your manner, your style to the audience, and then you'll win them over. He starts to practice in front of the mirror. He practices some of his gesticulations in front of the mirror. His gesture, that famous one with the hand going back, um, and, and how it went to pause in a speech. He has a series of photographs taken so that he can see which gesticulations work best in his speeches. So he's really into the idea of image. It's, it's easy to poo-poo that and think that this is a vain and self-obsessed thing to do, which of course Hitler was. But at the same time, it makes total sense. If oratory is one of your hallmarks, you've got to get it right. So why not practice in front of the mirror? With a new glossy image, Hitler now needs someone to sell it. He's already found the perfect person. Failed writer, Joseph Goebbels. It's hard to imagine a less perfect form of Nordic Superman than Joseph Goebbels. If anybody doesn't look like a Nazi, it's Goebbels. He's short, he's slight, he's physically imperfect because he's got a club foot, and he's also really quite ugly. But what he has is a very quick mind. He's a PhD in philology, and he recognises the power of propaganda and words. With hang-ups about his height, his disability and his rejection from the German army because of it, he also despises the Weimar government. Goebbels' feelings about the Weimar Republic can be easily summed up. He detested it, he loathed it from the bottom of his heart. He thought it was a corrupt, decadent parliamentary system. He came from a very poor Catholic background but he'd uh, fallen out with the Catholic Church. He was a man of great intelligence and talent, but in search of a direction. And his early direction was nationalist, but towards the left of the Nazi party. Despite being more left-leaning in his politics, Goebbels shares Hitler's anti-Semitic beliefs. He really did hate Jews. He hated people who didn't conform. Arguably, he is the most unpleasant of all the Nazis. But in, in terms of his vindictiveness and his hatreds, uh, very, very sharp. But keen to attract the attentions of Hitler, it's his gift for flattery that first gets him noticed. In a letter prompted by Hitler's speeches during his trial for the Beer Hall Putsch, Goebbels had written, Like a rising star, you appeared before our wandering eyes. You performed miracles to clear our minds and, in a world of skepticism and desperation, gave us faith. You named the need of a whole generation. 
One day Germany will thank you. Almost overnight, Goebbels was changed. Here was a man he thought he could identify with. He threw himself into politics locally, working for the Nazi party in the Rhineland where he lived. And intriguingly, he developed uh, an adulation of this man whom he had never met and did not know in person. It was not, in fact, for another 15 months that he met Hitler for the first time in the summer of 1925. And then he said, he's everything I had hoped for. He's, he's all that he had hoped for and more. Once he came under Hitler's spell, he developed a schoolgirl crush on, on this man. In an entry in his diary on the 23rd of November, 1925, Goebbels writes, Great joy. He greets me like an old friend. How I love him. What a fellow. Then he speaks. How small I am. He gives me his photograph with a greeting to the Rhineland. Heil Hitler. I want Hitler to be my friend. Goebbels is so taken by Hitler, he quickly abandons his leftist interests. In order to rebrand the entire Nazi party, Hitler recognizes he needs the help of a man like Goebbels. A lot of the Nazi party regarded Goebbels as the truly brilliant one amongst the Nazis. He was very quick-witted. He doesn't have this lumpen, cliched, Prussian, German way of doing things by the book. He's also enormously hardworking. He's a tremendously energetic man, ready to work long, long hours, to travel incessantly. He's a much more resourceful figure. If there's a problem, Goebbels will be very good at fixing it. Goebbels will be the man to go to. With restrictions still placed on the party in many places across Germany, Hitler needs someone who can attract new voters. Goebbels was a man who understood intuitively modern methods of propaganda. We see a shift towards the print media by necessity because Hitler's prevented from giving those public speeches, but that then sets the tone for very much. A whole range of Nazi newspapers, Nazi magazines emerge. The Nazis are right there leading from the front when it comes to the pioneering use on leaflets, in illustrated papers, on election posters. Hitler's so impressed by Goebbels, in November 1926, he hands him the important role of taking the Nazi party message to the nation's capital, Berlin. Goebbels came to Berlin in 1926 as an outsider. He didn't know the city. And importantly, this was not a city in which the Nazis were strong. Berlin had a reputation then as a communist stronghold, a trade unionist stronghold, and Goebbels therefore was tasked by Hitler with a very difficult mission. Berlin always left wing in sympathies. The eastern side of the city certainly to a large degree controlled by the communists, and it became Goebbels' job to win Red Berlin for the Nazis and to wean it away from communism. Goebbels has lorries scatter leaflets through the city streets, pastes the city walls with red swastikas and posters, and uses his Berlin newspaper, Der Angriff, the attack, to feed Hitler's political ideology to the masses. But he also uses another great talent. speech making. The ban on public speaking is lifted in 1927. Goebbels now becomes a regular speech maker for the Nazis. He himself was second only to Hitler in his oratory. Uh, although a small, unimpressive man physically, he could electrify an audience with his passion and his oratory. So he was an extremely valuable man to have on Hitler's side. 
where Hitler's style is aggressive and passionate. Goebbels is sharp-tongued and sarcastic. Goebbels thrived in a confrontational atmosphere. He was at his best in a smoky hall with his opponents present. His speeches were long, they were often erudite, but they were also witty and entertaining, and he had a particular ability to put down hecklers. But behind the smart exterior, Goebbels is a thug. He and his Nazi party bully boys, the SA brown shirts, regularly provoke the opposition parties with the aim of causing bloodshed. Goebbels' SA specialised at going into working class areas of Berlin, holding speeches and events which they knew would rouse the ire of the left-leaning local paramilitaries. This could be guaranteed to cause a fight. They battled it out literally in the streets using uh, coshes, using chair legs, using bottles and beer mugs. They even shot and stabbed each other on the street. Unhesitatingly, Goebbels used violence to achieve his end. Following an early 1927 political rally and a brawl with communists, Goebbels writes in his diary, A procession through town. Our brave lads hauled a Jew out of a bus. How I love these lads. We are creating uproar all over Berlin. While Goebbels is busy sorting out the German capital, back in Munich, Hitler is working on the final touches to his image. He wants something that will set him apart. As the aspiring ruler of Germany, Hitler is looking to create his own special bodyguard. The obvious group to recruit from are the SA brown shirts, but they're seen as too thuggish. He needs something more elite, more presidential. Enter the Schutzstaffel, Hitler's new protection force or SS. The SS are meant to be the ideal of German manhood. Membership is restricted only to those who can trace their Aryan ancestry back to the 18th century. You could compare the SS to a kind of imperial guard from ancient Rome. They were the tallest, the best, the fittest, and they were dressed in these immaculate black uniforms. The distinctive uniforms which Hitler will eventually put them in are made by clothes designer and Nazi party member, Hugo Boss. Nothing is more striking in Nazi propaganda than the outfit of the SS. Meant to be daunting, meant to be frightening. He had to wear black boots. He had to have black breeches. And they also have this skull and crossbones emblem, the Totenkopf. The Totenkopf is meant to symbolize strength and purpose, loyalty, and commitment unto death. With a fast evolving party image, a powerful propaganda machine behind them and the 1928 election on the horizon. At last, Hitler can put his new-look Nazis to the test. The Nazi party machinery has been revamped. Party membership has increased fourfold since 1925. Hitler is busy putting into practice the tactic of looking outwardly respectable while sticking firmly to his secret agenda. Traveling around the country, he gives dynamic speeches that reach out to the unemployed and frustrated working classes while reassuring the wealthy that he's not an extremist. 
but there's precious little mention of his real agenda. The Jews. Hitler tries to project the party as a kind of model of political respectability. He tries to tone down anti-Semitism. Instead, he targets the rural working classes, where Jew baiting isn't an electoral issue. There are no Jews in these local rural communities, so really they're more interested in agricultural prices, they're interested in the prices of their goods as they take them to market. They're not really interested in the Jewish question. And there's another reason for the Nazis to play down their anti-Semitism. Hitler wants to seek business support as well. Most of Germany's major businesses are still exporting and interchanging with people in other countries who are Jewish. Hitler's central political thrust isn't racist, but economic. He warns that the country's booming economy is propped up by American money, which, if pulled out, will see Germany collapse. The phrase that Hitler uses in some of his speeches is that Weimar is dancing on a volcano and that really all of this prosperity is down to loans and eventually it will all collapse and Germany will go back into a terrible state of depression again for relying on these American loans. But when the election results come in, in May 1928, it's a shock. The Nazis receive just 2.6% of the vote. The communists, Hitler's main rivals, have gained four times more support. Hitler and his party have done worse than they did in the 1924 elections. The new image hasn't worked. It looks like the Nazi party's going nowhere. They were still an extremist party on the fringe with a minuscule percentage of the vote. But you have to remember that Germany was still enjoying a spell in the economic sunshine. Nazism was like a, a snowball. It flourished in cold, dark times. But you subject it to sunlight and it will melt. And if, if the economy is the sun, that's what will happen to Nazism. It'll only be strong in critical times. It's a party that depends on extreme conditions. It won't be strong when things are going well. And 28 is an interesting commentary, really, on that. The party had, couldn't make inroads. In the aftermath of the election results, Joseph Goebbels writes in his diary... In a depression. The necessary reaction to the last few weeks. Hitler and his inner circle despair that they will ever gain power. It seems the legitimate route has failed. But an earth-shattering event changes everything. On the 24th of October, 1929, the stock market in Wall Street crashes. As Hitler had predicted, American banks call in their loans in a frantic effort to save themselves. When America ran into trouble, then it pulled in its horns, it stopped buying goods, it stopped loaning money, and every country suffers because they're all tied into this international system. The Great Depression sees countless thriving businesses plunged into bankruptcy all over the world. In Germany, the effects are devastating. Without their US loans, banks collapse. Unemployment shoots up dramatically. In just eight weeks, it rises from 3% to 26%. Germany increases its unemployed by 6 million. And when you think that 
Another three people are affected by an unemployed person in the house. That meant 24 million Germans were affected by the Wall Street crash. Virtually no one escapes its effects. People who'd painstakingly built up their savings after the hyperinflation of the early 20s are hit hard. The middle class were again faced with a renewal of the nightmare that they had seen around about 1923 when the huge inflation beggared them, actually wiped out their savings almost overnight. Humiliation and misery is compounded by poverty and starvation as parents struggle to feed their children. Chaos returns as the German people increasingly lose confidence in the Weimar Republic. Germany really is in a terrible state, and you can see that by what happens very quickly. It's the hunger, it's the poverty, it's the real desperation that comes to Germany out of that Wall Street crash that we see the seeds of the turn away from democracy and towards the Nazi party. One man had predicted this all along. Suddenly, people are seeing him differently. Adolf Hitler's no longer a radical extremist. He's a prophet. What he said would happen has begun to happen. Who is to blame? Well, at our distance removed, we say, well, it's a matter of international finance. But to the Nazi, international finance was Jewish finance. This is a great plot, as Hitler sees it. We told you what was happening, and now here's the proof positive. With the German nation in despair, at last, Hitler has the real opportunity he's been waiting for. Crucially, many of those who've suffered most as a result of the Great Depression are those who had ignored Hitler and voted against him. Now they are ready to listen to his message. The Nazis are on the rise.